So we are very glad. We are very glad to have Greg Moore from Rutgers. The title of his talk and his first slide: two-dimensional categorical wall crossing with twisted masses and application to not invariance. So Lino just posted his slides in the chat. Greg, please. Okay, so I'm trying to see if I can get the zoom bar out of the way so it's not hmm, interfering with my slides. Yeah. Does anybody know how to minimize the zoom bar with all the? Uh, actually, I'll, I'll just work around. I it I, I, I I don't see. Um, ah, you mean at the bottom? Yeah. The, okay. Ah, I just did it. Okay. Good. 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 Now it's fine. Now it's fine. All right. Yes. So here's thank you, Jan, for inviting me to give a seminar. And the title of my talk is 2D Categorical Wall Crossing with Twisted Masses with an application to knot invariance, if you're patient enough at the end to listen to that. Okay, so part of this talk is a review of old things um, going way back, and also some foundational material with uh, Davide Gaiotto and Edward Witten from a paper several years ago. And the new things are work with my graduate student, Asan Khan, He's actually my former graduate student. He just graduated about a week ago and is now a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. And at the end, if I have time, I'd like to add a little comment that came out of, well, it's work in progress with Asan and Davide Gaiato and Fei Yan. Fei Yan is a uh, postdoc at Rutgers and she's very good and she's looking for a job. Um, and that was part of a larger a uh, broader set of discussions that included uh, Andy Neitsky and Tudor de Mofta that got us started with that project. So let's start uh, simple by recalling the relationship between supersymmetric quantum mechanics and homological algebra. In particular, the, the foundational and basic observation of Witten relating superquantum mechanics and Morse theory or more important for today, Morse-Novikov theory. So to formulate this super quantum mechanics, you choose a Ramanian manifold M and alpha, which is a closed one form. So now locally, uh, alpha is D of a real valued function. Traditionally in super quantum mechanics, they say you start with the data of a Ramanian manifold and a real valued super potential but in fact, all you need is a closed one form and H need not be single valued so long as alpha is single valued. In other words, alpha need not be exact. It does need to be single valued, but it need not be exact. And that's quite important for what we're doing today. I'll call alpha the super one form. Now in super quantum mechanics, the field, if you like, in the theory, if you think of it as a zero plus one dimensional theory, uh, the field is a map from the line of time into the Ramanian manifold M. And the action principle, the Lagrangian for this map, well, it's a supersymmetric theory. I've only shown the bosonic terms. The leading term is the uh, usual kinetic term. Gij is the Ramanian metric. And then we use, uh, we take the norm squared of alpha. So you see, that's why alpha has to be single valued so that we have a well-defined uh, Lagrangian. So here's the action. Uh, alpha squared, the norm alpha squared is the potential energy. So the classical vacua correspond to the zeros of alpha. I'll call those critical points. We'll assume that they're isolated and that they're massive. And what massive means is if I consider this matrix over i and j of derivatives of alpha at the critical points that's invertible. Now in quantum mechanics, you show that for each of these classical vacua, there's an approximate ground state. I'll call it psi of phi i. And you can calculate what physicists call the fermion number of that ground state. And it, uh, it turns out to be half of the difference between the negative and number of negative and positive eigenvalues of this mass matrix di alpha j. So therefore, it's basically the Morse index. Now, the approximate vacua are not exact vacua in the exact quantum field, quantum theory. 
because of instanton effects. And the instantons are described by solutions of this flow equation. And we use these instantons to define an operator, Q, on the approximate ground states. So if we have an approximate ground state associated with fermion number Fi, then by definition, Q on psi is the sum over all approximate ground states with one higher fermion number weighted by the number of instantons from i to j. And now you can prove this quadratic identity on these integers by studying the, um, the moduli space of flows that increase fermion number by two and looking at the boundaries of that. And you can prove this identity, the broken uh, flow identity. Greg, I'm uh, confused in, in, in two things. First, your Riemannian manifold, is it compact? Well, it's not um, uh, because if not then uh, you should specify the behavior of your gradient lines at infinity i i agree with that i agree and, with that and so, second uh, confusion is that nij are the integers because yeah. in novikov theory they are elements of the novikov that's, ring that's right that's right that's right so um I'll say later, yes, indeed. So Nij would be elements of the Novikov ring, and the case for alpha is not exact. That's a very good point. And um, I'm going to be more careful about that when I get to the ap main application here, which is to Landau-Ginsburg models. And I think I'll answer your question later, but I won't really answer it. I won't really be very careful about that point while I'm discussing the super quantum mechanics, but you're quite right. Now, let's assume M is compact for this discussion, although I am going to apply these ideas to um, infinite dimensional M, where I can't assume it's compact. Um, so you're right, and but I will say something about uh, boundary conditions at infinity. So we'll, we'll, I think I'm going to address the issues you're raising when I apply these ideas to um, Lando Ginsburg models. But if you're not happy with that, please let me know. So those are good questions. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so uh, if M is compact and we remember that the Nij's are not integers, but elements of the Novikov ring, that's, this is still true. And Q squared is zero because of this broken flow identity. In other words, what we have is chain complex. Uh, the vector space of the chain complex, we could do it over Z, but let's just say it's a vector space over C. The vector space is the span of these approximate ground states. Um, the homological grading, which physicists call fermion number, which in general is valued in a Z torsor, is, uh, I just defined it in fact, and by definition, um, Q raises fermion number by one, and then the differential is what physicists call the supersymmetry operator. So I'll denote this complex by the MSW complex. I'll denote it by MSW of M, G, and alpha. And the exact ground states, the main claim of Witten, was that the exact ground states of the super quantum mechanics is just the cohomology of this complex, which is, which is in ge geometrically, is just the hum the cohomology with respect to the, of M with respect to the flat connection D plus alpha. Now it's very interesting to ask what happens if you have homo homotopies of this data. So let's consider a continuous family of metrics and super one forms and ask how does the MSW complex change? So you can define a map U from the MSW complex. I'll call S a control parameter. You can define a map U from the complex at one control parameter, S1, to another, S2, uh, by considering this flow equation now in S, it's like the instanton equation, but now in the control parameter. And U now maps uh, states with fermion number F at control parameter S1 to states with the same fermion number at control parameter S2. So by definition, U commutes with fermion number, and then by an analog of the broken flow equation, it uh, commutes with the supersymmetry operator. In other words, under continuous deformation of metric and super one form, the MSW complex changes by chain map. Actually, it's a very special kind of chain map. It's a homotopy equivalence of chain complexes. So let's recall why, what, what that means. So 
if we have a path of paths, and in other words, a, a continuous map from the square into the space of all metrics and one super one forms with suitable boundary conditions, then at u equals zero, we get one chain map between the two complexes. And at u equals one, we get another one. And you can show that the difference of these two chain maps is again, Q exact in the sense where you can actually define this operator E now mapping fermion number F to fermion number F minus one, again, counting solutions of these, uh, these equations. Okay, and so let's recall that two chain maps are homotopic if there's a fermion number minus one map from V1 to V2, such that the difference of the two chain maps is Q exact, by which I mean this equation here. And now if we have chain maps going both ways, whose composition both ways is homotopic to the identity chain map, then we say that the chain complexes are homotopy equivalent. And so homotopy equivalence is gonna be pretty important to this talk. Okay, so now let's apply these ideas, at least notionally, to um, the one plus one dimensional quantum field theory is known as uh, two comma two Landau Ginzburg models. So to define a Landau Ginzburg model, we choose a Kähler manifold X. I, actually, I should stop and ask, are there any further questions? Okay. Okay, so we're gonna define a one plus one dimensional or two dimensional quantum field theory. So now let capital X and uh, be a Kähler manifold with Kähler metric gij bar. And now introduce a one form alpha. Um, it's gonna be a one zero form and it's gonna be holomorphic. Again, if you've heard about landau ginzburg models or the fukaya seidel category, for example, you normally consider a Kähler manifold and then a holomorphic Morse function W. So here it's important that we're gonna be considering uh, more um, uh, super potentials, capital W, which are not multi-valued, but such that if I take the derivative of W, then the corresponding one form is single valued. That's all we need in order to define our quantum field theory. So the, the action of the one plus one dimensional quantum field theory is given by this formula here where D is some spatial domain. And again, I'm only showing the bosonic terms in the action. So the first term is the standard sigma model type action. And then we have a potential energy from the norm squared of alpha. Now, if the spatial domain is the full real line, then this is a Poincaré invariant, um, Lorentz invariant, Poincaré invariant quantum field theory. And if D is the, sp the real line, then we can ask for the Poincaré invariant vacua and at least classically, those would be the zeros of the potential energy, constant field configurations where uh, uh, the field phi i is at a zero of alpha. So I'll call those the vacua. And because of supersymmetry, those are actually exact vacua of the quantum theory. Later on, we'll talk about brains where the spatial domain is a half line. Now, you can consider this two-dimensional Landau-Ginzburg model, at least formally, as a one-dimensional superquantum mechanics, the one dimension being time. And the target space of the superquantum mechanics is, is this mapping space, calligraphic X, which is the space of all maps, phi, from your spatial domain into the Kähler manifold X. So the Kähler metric on capital X induces a Kähler metric on this infinite dimensional mapping space, calligraphic X, by this formula. So delta phi I is a canonical uh, differential that you can write on the mapping space. And so the uh, Kähler metric, the blue, on the capital X induces one on the calligraphic X. And similarly, the one form, the one zero form on capital X induces a super one form of the super quantum mechanics. I'll call it alpha tilde on calligraphic X. And here's the formula. So to define it, you would, in, in the first term here, you would integrate over the spatial domain of the pullback by phi of the Kähler form omega. So omega is a two form and you pull it back, you get a two form, you integrate over the spatial domain. That's a one form and that's a one form on the space calligraphic X. 
And similarly, you can contract alpha i with these cotangent vectors, delta phi i. Uh, Here, I've introduced a phase. Yeah. Just oh, yeah. let me finish the sentence uh -huh. and then we'll uh, discuss. Right. Uh, okay. There's a phase zeta, which for the moment doesn't matter, but will make a big difference when we consider brains. And then we integrate dx. So this is the super one form alpha tilde. Was there a question? No, no, it was a question about zeta. So it's not just one form, it's a family. So Indeed, yes, yes. You so will zeta have the, a, the wall crossing because you change. There will be wall crossing in zeta. Absolutely, yes, that's correct. So zeta is a, a parameter which um, will play an important role later. Yes, quite correct. Uh, do um, you assume that zeros are simple, uh, like like Morse? Uh, yes, 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 yes. So alpha, you should think of alpha as um, just like in the quantum mechanics. So alpha is locally dw, where w is locally a holomorphic Morse function. So the critical points of w are going to be isolated and massive Morse. So now it's a nice little exercise to do the following. You just work formally and you work out the Lagrangian or the action of the super quantum mechanics with this calligraphic X as your target space and this alpha tilde is your super one form. And the result is the action of a one plus one dimensional quantum field theory, which is the Lando Ginsberg model for this capital X and alpha. Uh, sorry, but probably you should multiply alpha by zeta minus one in no. the right hand side. No, the zeta actually cancels out. Uh, it just cancels out of that calculation. You'll literally get this. Uh, this ah, if mm -hmm. you see, um, oh. I'm talking. I'm working up to boundary terms. So the zeta dependence will come in in boundary terms in the action. All right. Okay. But in the bulk term, uh, the zeta dependence will drop out. Okay, so now in the usual discussion, as I said before, alpha is exact, where w is a holomorphic Morse function. But uh, we're going to be interested in the case where alpha is not exact. If alpha has non-zero periods, then of course there's no single value superpotential. And in the physics literature, that's called the case of twisted masses. So how do we work with these twisted masses? Well, this gets this is related to what Jan was saying before. Um, we can work on the minimal abelian cover, call it x hat over x, such that the pullback of alpha is exact. And so there is a well-defined single-valued superpotential w hat on this minimal abelian cover. And we'll let gamma be the free abelian deck group, which, so the gamma is a free abelian group which acts on x hat, and the quotient of x hat by gamma is x. And you can think of gamma as a subgroup of the first homology group of X, capital X. So it's often useful to consider the Landau-Ginsberg theory X uh, up on the cover and then work equivariantly with respect to gamma. And that's how the Novikov ring comes in when we do stuff like that, like the uh, complexes. So now the vacua of the theory on the cover where there's a single valued superpotential is just given by the uh, the critical points of the single valued superpotential w hat upstairs and just to simplify notation I'll I'll abbreviate these vacua these critical points of w hat by phi hat a phi hat b and I'll simply abbreviate those by a b and so on and I'll write the free gamma action on these vacua as a goes to a plus gamma so for example, if I consider the critical values, w hat of these, um, at these critical points, then if I shift a by gamma, uh, the critical value w hat a plus gamma is w hat a plus the period of alpha around this uh, homology class gamma. So a simple example, just to fix ideas, supposing our Kähler manifold x is, is, is C star with the standard metric, then we can consider uh, our super, uh, our one form, our one zero form, to be um, m over phi minus one. So the zeros of alpha, well, there's only one of them. So there's just one vacuum in this theory. Now, um, but still, it's obvious if, if the mass m is not zero, that m has the interpretation of a twisted mass. And if the mass m is not zero, then alpha is obviously not exact. So in that case, we would take a cover, which is just given by the exponential map, 
the, uh, the deck group is Z, and the pullback of alpha to the cover is indeed exact. And W hat is M phi hat minus E to the phi hat. So the critical points upstairs, the V hat, is a Z torsor. So it's this infinite set of, of uh, vacua upstairs. And the critical values are given by this formula here. And clearly, if I shift A by N, then uh, the critical value shifts by the period of alpha times. So the corresponding exponential integral is basically gamma function up to a fa factor. Yeah. Uh, if, so I consider the, uh, if I consider the e to the w hat integral over a cycle. Yeah, like in Landau-Ginsburg model, you integrate yes. over Lagrangian brains, which... Uh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's a good comment. Um, I don't think I'm going to make use of that comment, but uh, that's a good comment, yeah. So other examples of interest... Well, one uh, very interesting example is the mirror of the CP1 model. So again, X is C star, but now alpha is a little more elaborate. And this has been discussed uh, in the kind of framework I'm talking about here in this talk and in some papers by Dima Galakhov, who's at IPMU and is now looking for a job. And in a paper I will, that's up, my upcoming paper with Asan Khan. Now notice that there, there are two zeros of alpha because it's quadratic and phi, so there are two vacua, phi i and phi j, and a rank one deck group. And there are lots of lando gitzberg models that are used to uh, give uh, ways of formulating not homology that have appeared in a number of physics papers. And a common feature of all those lando gitzberg models for not homology is they involve these kind of multi-valued superpotentials. And then there's a very interesting uh, example, which I call Chern Simon's Landau Ginsberg theory. Um, and we'll come back to it at the end of the talk if there's time. So if GC is a complex Lie group and M3 is a Ramanian three manifold, we can form the Landau Ginsberg model, which I'll call the Chern Simon's Landau Ginsberg model, depends on a Lie group and on a three manifold. And the target space. Uh, the Kähler manifold target space is itself infinite dimensional in this case. So the target space is the space of complex GC connections on a three manifold M3. And the one form on capital X is given by taking the trace of F squared and integrating over M3. So that's at least formally D of locally, that's D of the Chern Simons action of the complex connection. So the vacua of this landau ginsberg theory on the real line are the flat GC connections on the three manifold. So we'll come back to this case uh, in, at the end. So that's just an interesting special case. Now, returning to the general theory, I said that we can think of the landau ginsberg theory in terms of the super quantum mechanics. And I began the talk by reminding you about the um, the way we are led to chain complexes in the superquantum mechanics. So let's look at that. So what were the generators of the chain complexes in superquantum mechanics? They were the, the zeros, the approximate vacua associated with the zeros of the super one form. So in our situation here, our super one form alf is alpha tilde. And if you work out what is the zero of alpha tilde, a zero of alpha tilde in landau ginsberg language is exactly the same thing as a solution of this differential equation, which I've written here. It's a differential equation in one variable, x. And I'll call that the zeta soliton equation, um, because solutions of this equation are known as solitons in physics. The, now, is it has the trajectories of the gradient, the flow? Well, if, if alpha flow. were exact, yeah, I'm going to come to that later. If alpha is exact, if it's, if it's the, uh, the derivative of a superpotential, then indeed solutions of this equation would project to straight lines in the capital W plane. Uh, no, but if you, have, uh, if you have a Riemannian metric or whatever, you have an isomorphism between tangent and cotangent bundles. So to mm -hmm. any one form, you can associate the vector field and take it. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is a flow by a vector field, absolutely. Yes, that's correct. That's absolutely right. Um, yeah. <coughs> um, okay. So 
Now, in the super quantum mechanics, remember, we had to talk about gradient, f um, about instanton flows in the time direction, which is roughly d phi d tau equals alpha tilde. And you work out what that means in terms of the Landau Ginsburg theory and a solution of the, of the, the uh, gradient flow uh, of the flow equation, of the instanton flow equation in super quantum mechanics in Landau Ginsburg language, is a solution of this. Uh, partial differential equation in the x and tau plane, which I'll call the zeta instanton equation. You see it's a, a deformation of the Cauchy-Riemann equation. Uh, in the math literature, it's often called this, the Witten equation. Uh, there are so many Witten equations that I find that unhelpful, so I call it the zeta instanton equation. And that will play a very important role for us. So now, um, Let's think about, from the super quantum mechanics point of view, what is this more smell witten complex for this super quantum mechanics? Well, in order for the theory to be well-defined, we have to choose some boundary conditions on the zeta soliton equation on the real line. And the proper boundary conditions to choose are that phi of x goes to a vacuum phi i uh, on the far left and a vacuum phi j on the far right. And once I make that choice, I have a uh, more smell witten complex, R sub ij. So uh, as a vector space, it's the span over the approximate ground states associated with each of the classical solitons, phi ij of x, which uh, solve the zeta soliton equation with these boundary conditions, phi i and phi j. Uh, Greg, I'm sort of starting to, to, to lose the thread so you are in the holomorphic situation like if your one form was mm, exact like for the mm -hmm. uh, uh, super potential w mm -hmm. so uh, the morse indices of all critical points were the same and they were for generic zeta the, there are no trajectories joining them so then your uh, uh, differential in the Morse complex or in the Novikov complex here is trivial. That's right. So only for very special phases zeta will this Rij be non-zero. Oh, okay. That's true. So uh, for generic zeta, this Rij is zero, but as we'll soon see for special values of zeta, so I've left this phase zeta general for the moment, but, um, uh, and you're right, for general phases zeta, the, com the, um, the complex will simply be zero. Uh, but for special phases zeta, which we'll come to in a sec, um, the, the, the complex is non-zero. Hmm. Um, now you can calculate the fermion number of these uh, approximate ground states. And it turns out to be the eta invariant of a Dirac operator which you get by linearizing the zeta soliton equation. And again, QIJ counts the zeta instantons that interpolate between different uh, phi ij solitons. Now in the case with twisted masses, there's an interesting extra ingredient here, which is the flavor charge. So what is the flavor charge? Well, if I have a classical phi ij soliton, then I can uh, take the image of that soliton of the real line uh, with these boundary conditions, and that defines a path in the target space, capital X. And so that path, well, on the left, I started at phi i, and as I evolve in X, it goes to phi j. So that path in capital X evolves from the vacuum phi i to phi j. And if I consider that path up to homology, I'll call that the charge little gamma sub ij. So little gamma sub ij lives in capital gamma i sub j. Capital gamma sub ij is the space of paths in this Kähler manifold capital X from phi i, the critical, the, 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 the zero of alpha phi i to the zero of alpha phi j considered up to homology. Now, notice that we can add charges in the following sense. If I have one of these charges that goes from phi i to phi j and another charge uh, describing the homology class of a path from phi j to phi k, I, I claim I can sum them. 
and get an element of gamma ik because after all, I can compose these paths and consider it up to homology. And in particular, if the beginning and the endpoint are the same, then I get an abelian group structure. And so gamma ii is canonically uh, the abelian group gamma. And in general, gamma ij is a gamma torsor. So now this rij then is graded by this gamma torsor, uh, graded by these charges, little gamma ij. And the BPS index then is the trace uh, of, well, is essentially the Euler character because this fermion number is essentially, um, well, this fermion number is, an, is, is, is valued in a Z torsor. So this is basically the Euler character of these subcomplexes R sub gamma ij. So for each little gamma ij, we have a BPS index. Uh, these zeta solitons uh, have a, what's called an n equals two central charge, which will be very important, um, which is the integral of this alpha, this one form alpha along this homology. It's not really a homology class, it's, it's a open path considered up to homology with fixed endpoints, gamma ij. Well, it's a relative homology. It's a relative homology class, thank you. Um, but it's oriented from phi i to phi j, that, uh, that's correct. And this generalizes the very familiar formula from um, Fukaya Seidel theory, for example, that the n equals two central charge is uh, the BPS central charge. It's sometimes called is ZIJ is the difference of the critical values. This is more. This is the generalization. Notice it has the twisted mass property that if I shift gamma IJ by by gamma by a closed homology class, then Z gamma IJ shifts by the period of alpha. Okay, now I come to this point that. Um, <coughs> that Jan was making before. It's very useful, as I said before, to work on the cover where there is a well-defined uh, superpotential W hat. And so then the boundary conditions we would consider for the zeta soliton equation on the cover require that phi hat goes to phi hat A, which projects to phi I on the left, and phi hat B, which projects to phi J on the right. And now it's a famous fact that if you have a solution of the zeta soliton equation and you have a well-defined superpotential and you project in s the image of that solution into the complex W hat plane, you get a straight line. And the straight line has a, uh, a phase which is given by I zeta. So because of the boundary condition on the left, uh, we have a straight line coming out of the critical value W hat of A. And because of the boundary condition on the right, we have a straight line going into the uh, critical value w hat of b. But of course, these have to match up. So as Jan said, for general zeta, there are no classical solitons. So this r gamma ij is only non-zero if i zeta is parallel to the phase of z gamma ij. Now, in the case where we have twisted masses, and we do not have a superpotential which is on, on the base, but only on the covering space x hat, there's some qualitatively new features having to do with periodic solitons. So we could consider the case where the boundary condition B on the right is just a deck transformation of the boundary condition on the left. In other words, when I project back into x, I have the same vacuum phi i on the far left and the far right. So if there were a, uh, um, a superpotential downstairs, well, you can write the zeta soliton equation as a gradient flow equation. So if there were a super well-defined superpotential downstairs, then the only solution of the zeta soliton equation with these boundary conditions would be the constant phi of x equals phi i for all x. But without gradient flow, and there are twisted masses, we can have non-trivial solutions, so lots of examples of that. And, um, in particular, the n equals two central charge, z is non-zero, it will be the, uh, the period of alpha defined by this closed path um, described by the soliton. So uh, we have non-zero complexes, r i i, which are graded, uh, z fermion number and gamma graded. So now the main new ingredient, looking ahead, the main new ingredient in the categorified wall crossing formula with twisted masses involves Fox spaces, which are constructed from these RIIs. It's very similar to the halo picture 
of the physical derivations of the four-dimensional Kuntzsevich Slavelman and wall crossing formula, which was given about 10 years ago. Maybe more, more. Anyway, um, so speaking of wall crossing, let's just review a few things about wall crossing. So first, let's recall something about wall crossing when alpha is exact and there is a well-defined superpotential downstairs. So then I consider a homotopy of the basic data that defines the landau ginsberg theory, namely the Kähler metric and the superpotential. And now it's a famous fact that these BPS indices are only piecewise constant in that case. That goes back to a, a Chikati, Fenley, and Trilligator in Waffe in uh, early 90s. Um, and so it's very different from the finite dimensional situation where the uh, Euler character is, is a homotopy invariant. And now then Chikani and Waffe went on in the early 90s to tell, give a formula for exactly how the mu ij uh, jump as a, as a function of this control parameter. And I'll, I'll review that formula later on in the talk. But uh, what we want to do today is go further. We want to talk about the so-called categorified chikati vava wall crossing formula, which describes more. It describes how the homotopy equivalence class of these chain complexes, Rij, jumps. So physicists have a kind of slogan that the only meaningful information about BPS states of the BPS indices are maybe refined BPS indices. And you shouldn't try and describe the, the, the spaces of states of BPS states. I disagree with that uh, general folklore. There is refined information when BPS states are described by chain complexes. Namely, I claim that the homotopy equivalence class of those chain complexes is a physically uh, meaningful uh, and uh, piece of information which refines the indices. Okay, so um, we'll talk about, I'll give later a, a very concrete formula for the how these homotopy equivalence classes of these, uh, uh, these soliton chain complexes jumps. But first I wanna say some things about what happens when you, to wall crossing when you go with, uh, to the case of twisted masses. So there are qualitatively new phenomena because we have new kinds of walls where um, the central charge for gamma ij with not equal to, i not equal to j becomes parallel to one of these uh, periods of alpha for a closed cycle gamma. So for example, if I just have two vacua and a rank one deck group, as I do in the CP1 model, then the potential BPS rays in the upper half plane might look like this. And so you see there's BPS rays which are accumulating to the, uh, the ray associated with the central charge Z gamma. And now if I have parameters changing so that Z gamma IJ sweeps up to Z gamma, then an infinite number of rays are, are crossing. And so we have to take that into account. This, I'll call this the peacock pattern, and we'll come back to it later in the talk. So to write the wall crossing formula with twisted masses, it's convenient to introduce what I call the vacuum groupoid algebra, whose objects are these vacua and morphisms are these homology, these relative homology classes, gamma ij. And for the vacuum groupoid algebra, for each gamma ij, we introduce a variable, x sub gamma ij, and the product of the x's is zero unless the paths compose, in which case it's the x of the product of the composition of the paths. So now to write the for wall crossing formula, we introduce for i not equal to j and a charge gamma ij, what a so-called s factor, one plus the BPN S index times this, this x variable. And for every charge gamma in the deck group gamma, we introduce a k factor which is the sum over the vacua of a kind of Fox space character uh, weighted by X sub ui, where ui is just the additive identity in gamma ii. And then we choose a half plane and we consider the product of S and K factors for all charges that live in that half plane. And um, we order the factors by phase ordering of those n equals two central charges. So I'm sure if you've seen anything about the kuntzsevich soibelman wall crossing formula, you've seen this kind of formula many times before. And so indeed, the formula is that um, 
uh, S of H is invariant provided no VPS rays enter or leave the half plane H. And I call it the 2D 4D wall crossing formula even though there's no four dimensions here because the mathematics is formally very similar. In fact, our goal is to understand the categorification of a full 2D 4D wall crossing formula. And this is a step towards that goal. Uh, the, the idea of studying the twisted masses is that this is an important step towards that goal because the mathematics is formally similar. So let me show you a, uh, an example of the 2D, 4D wall crossing formula at work. Let's consider that case with two uh, vacua and a rank one deck group and go through this wall. And then um, this is what happens. So this is the general solution of that wall crossing statement. So we arrange all the BPS indices as follows for the BPS indices in the case where we have periodic solitons, we arrange them in a, uh, use them to form a kind of Fox space type character. And when I is not equal to J, we have a generating function involving the BPS indices of all the I not equal to J type solitons. So of course, as we cross the wall, we have similar generating functions. And the general solution of the wall crossing formula is given by this formula here. So you see explicitly that you can calculate the BPS um, indices on the, on the prime side of the wall given the indices on the other side of the wall in terms of these generating functions. So at the end of the talk, if there's time, we'll give a, generate, we'll give a uh, categorical analog of uh, this formula. I realize I, oh my God, I'm going awfully slowly. Um, I, uh, I forgot to put on my timer. So you'll have to Yeah, you can go all the time. I mean, yeah, you'll have to tell me when I'm out of time. I usually put on an hour timer, I just forgot. All right, so how do we uh, categorify these wall crossing formulas? Well, the key is to look at um, brains. So and study the A infinity category or algebra of brains. And then the claim is that the homotopy class of this category is invariant. So what's a brain? Well, we consider this one plus one dimensional quantum field theory on a half space. So we're working on a half line times time, and we have to put some boundary condition on that half line on the, at x equals x naught, say. Now, among the brains, there are some very special ones called Lefschetz symbols. So we choose a half plane, and then for each vacuum, there's this canonical brain called the Lefschetz symbol. And so I'll describe it in the case where the half plane is the right half plane, like in this picture here. And the way you describe the the support of the brain is you consider the possible values of the Landau-Ginzburg field at x naught at the boundary, so that if we look at solutions of the zeta soliton equation um, with that boundary condition at x equals x naught, and we evolve it using the zeta soliton equation in x, then as x goes to plus infinity, phi of x evolves to the to the to the vacuum phi i, and that set of possible initial values describes a submanifold of capital X, which turns out to be a Lagrangian subspace and provides nice half supersymmetric boundary conditions for that, len that quantum field theory. And those boundary conditions preserve a linear combination of the uh, n equals two comma two supersymmetries, namely this linear combination. And so now you see that phase zeta starts to play an important role. It governs, for example, exactly what um, com linear combination of supersymmetries is preserved. Also, um, uh, the, the corresponding MSW complexes now will be non-zero for generic zeta, unlike the case of the real line where we had to go to special zetas to have a non-zero MSW complex. So just to give a very simple example of a left shot symbol, if uh, W is a half phi squared, then the critical point, the, the vacuum is phi equals zero, the uh, zeta soliton equation is this, and it's so simple you can solve it explicitly. There are two branches of solutions, the plus and the minus branch. If we want the right left shot symbol, then we want phi of x to evolve to the critical point, phi equals zero, as x goes to plus infinity, so we have to choose the minus branch here. Now notice that uh, the solution, this, this, this uh, zeta soliton equation is not invariant under changing phi multiplying phi by a, a general complex number, but it is invariant 
under multiplying phi by a general real number. So um, the set of possible boundary uh, conditions is a, uh, is a straight line of a fixed phase inside the complex phi plane, and that's indeed a Lagrangian subvariety. And in a similar way, there's a left, left shut stem hole. Okay, so now we have these brains. So we choose a half plane and a phase, and we have these left shut stem holes, and um, you can you go on and define full brains uh, associated with them. And now we can consider this vector space of local boundary condition changing operators in the quantum field theory between these two brains of type i and j. And I'll call that vector space r hat sub i j. And I'll denote a boundary condition changing operator by this kind of uh, green square here. And because there's an unbroken supersymmetry, r hat i j is a chain complex. But it's much more. If I take the direct sum of all the r hat i j's, I get an algebra. Why is it an algebra? Because I have the operator product expansion. I can collide these operators. Because of the supersymmetry, uh, the, the operators will not have a singularity in the operator product expansion. It's a little different from conformal field theory. And so we just multiply them. And um, that gives us a bilinear operation, r hat ij tends to r hat jk to r hat ik. And in fact, there are higher operator products where we simultaneously collide n successive boundary condition changing operators. I'll call that operation row n. And it's, uh, if I include n equals 1, the n equals 1 would be the, the, the supersymmetry operator. Now, in the case where alpha is exact and there's a well-defined superpotential, um, these products have been studied very um, thoroughly uh, using something called the Webb formalism, uh, which was uh, written down by uh, in this paper by GMW, and it involves pictures like this. Well, I'll say a little more about what this picture means later. And if you use that formalism, you discover that row two is only associative up to Q exact terms. The failure of associativity is governed by row three and so on, uh, similar to topological string theory. In other words, you're discovering an A infinity algebra. So um, there are two basic sources for the web formalism. One is the paper with Gayato and Witten, and then there's an important paper uh, by Kapranov, Konsevich, and Seibelman reinterpreting that paper, uh, reinterpreting the webs in terms of uh, polygons. And that's an interesting thing to do because then there's a natural higher dimensional generalization in terms of polytopes. To, as far as I'm aware, there's no physical interpretation of the higher dimensional generalization that would be that's an interesting open problem. Now, people tell me that uh, this paper is too long, and that's why, I mean, it hasn't had a whole lot of impact. Um, and many people tell me, well, I, you know, I can't read this paper because it's 430 pages long, so I can't possibly read it. But that, I don't really buy that because there's another paper um, which summarizes the main ideas as only 51 pages long. So. Um, anyway, as I said, R hat is an A infinity algebra. What that means is that if I consider N successive boundary condition changing operators and I collide K successive operators using row K and then collide all the remaining operators, I have an operation, a two-step operation colliding the N operators to one. And now imagine I sum over all successive uh, sets of of, of k op boundary operators for all k, and I sum over the result with suitable signs and demand that at zero, that's called the A-infinity relations. The first of the A-infinity relations just says that row one squared is zero. As I said, row one is the, is the differential on the chain complex. So there's a, a notion of homotopy equivalence of chain complexes, which I reviewed before, and there's an analogous notion of homotopy equivalence of A infinity algebras, which I will not review for lack of time. But the important thing is that it extends the notion of homotopy equivalence of chain complex and says how the OPEs are related to each other. And so this homotopy equivalence of A infinity algebras is, a homotopy equivalence class of A infinity algebras is going to be some kind of wall crossing invariant. A little more is true. R hat is actually a category, and I'm still working in the case where alpha is exact. So again, we choose a half plane. The objects in the category are the thimbles. The Hom spaces between two thimbles, i and j, 
will be r hat ij, the space of boundary condition changing operators, will be r hat ij in the case where zij lies in the half plane. It'll just be the trivial complex z in degree zero if i equals j and zero otherwise. And I'll denote that category, which turns out to be an a infinity category by r hat, which depends on all this data. Now, an important formula, uh, an important fact is that this r hat ij, these hom spaces, can be written in terms of the uh, soliton uh, complexes Rij. And I don't have time to derive it for you, but I'll just state the result. So the result is this. If I take the R hat Ij's and I take the elementary matrix Eij, which is a one in the i row and jth column, then I get a matrix of complexes. And I claim it's a product of elementary factors. It's a product of elementary factors associated with pairs ij, i not equal to j, such that zij lives in the half plane in question. And the elementary factor is just the trivial complex z times the unit matrix plus rij, the MSW complex for solitons, uh, times eij. Now, because zij lives in the upper half plane, this is uh, an upper triangular matrix, and these matrices don't commute, so we have to phase order them as before. So now if you take this formula and you expand out the right-hand side, what you get is a, uh, uh, a formula for r hat, say, i, k, as a series of terms corresponding to series of central charges whose phases are clockwise ordered in the half plane. And we can associate pictures associated with the sum and. So the first sum and, r, i, k, is just this picture. So we have z i k, it lies in the half plane in question, and it separates, it's a line that separates vacuum i from k. The next sum and is associated with this picture. So r i j is associated with a line parallel to z i j, and r j k, a line parallel to z j k. And you see these, the central charges are clockwise ordered, and so on. Okay, so that's r hat i k as a vector space, but what is it as a complex? Well, given this formula, there's a naive differential you might put on r hat i k. You might say, well, okay, all the MSW complexes were uh, complexes, so there were differentials, q i k and q i j and so on. And so there's a, a naive differential, which as a mathematician, uh, one would naturally associate as the complex associated to r hat i k. That turns out to be physically wrong. And what well, went wrong it's here- mathematically wrong too, because you start with something undeformed, then you want to put a more orthogonal element. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's exactly where I'm going, right. Okay. Uh, well, one could put this chain, one could define a differential, but um, it's physically wrong. I'd, li I'd like to understand better how you would understand that immediately mathematically. But um, what goes wrong here is that we've missed important instanton effects. So let me describe these instantons. So they have to do with what are called domain wall junctions, solutions of the zeta instanton equations. So I've called for you here the zeta instanton equation. Zeta is any phase here. Um, so it's an equation in the x tau plane. So now what we do is we're going to put boundary conditions on this differential equation in the x plus i tau complex plane. <laughs> and I'll show you the first example, the first non-trivial example. So we, um, we have angular sectors in which phi at infinity goes to one of the vacuous, say phi i, phi j, and phi k in this picture in three angular sectors. And the boundaries between the angular sectors are given by rays which are parallel to the central charge zij. And as phi evolves across this ray, um, if the, the behavior of phi is governed by a phi ij uh, uh, type soliton. So if I have a classical phi ij soliton, I can say exactly how the field in the x tau plane evolves as I go from the i, th the I angular sector to the j angular sector. Now notice in order for this to work, the central charges have to have phases which are clockwise ordered. Zij, Zjk, and Zki. And beautifully, the image in the W plane of a solution of the zeta instanton equation fills in this polygon. And this is the polygon that was used in 
in Kapranov, Kontsevich, and Seibelman. And this story generalizes to multivalent n vertices. So um, that's what I mean by these uh, um, fans of boundary, uh, fans of vacua, and the zeta instantons associated with the fans of vacua. And you might be wondering if if actually if we really are there really are solutions of this partial differential equation with these strange boundary conditions, and indeed there are, and they were actually studied for rather different reasons a little bit over 20 years ago, and they're even exact solutions. So yeah, solutions exist, and so now we can define something called the interior amplitude where we count them. So if we have one of these fans of solitons, we choose classical solitons phi ij, phi jk, phi ki, such that the central charges are, are clockwise ordered, then we can consider this vector in rij, rjk, rki, and then we can just count the number of solitons. And we can sum over all uh, fans of solitons and define a vector which I'll call beta ijk. Now, if we consider these cyclic fans of vacua and associate to those cyclic products of the MSW soliton complexes, we get a space, a vector space called RC, which in fact has an L infinity algebra structure. And this beta, if I consider the analog of beta where I sum over all the zeta instantons, is a more Cartan element in that L infinity algebra. Okay, that, that interior amplitude then induces a chain map um, on uh, between MSW complexes. Let me show you what I mean by that. So because of CPT, there's a contraction of Rij and Rji to Z. And so the data of, of beta and the, and the contraction defines a chain map from Rik to Rij tensor Rjk. And that's part of what I mean by this picture here. The idea is that this instanton is modifying the naive differential by adding to that naive differential an off-diagonal piece in r hat i k, which takes r i k to r i j tensor r j k. And that leads us to the categorical wall crossing formula. So the general statement of categorical wall crossing is that if I have a homotopy of parameters defining the lando goodsberg model, then the associated A infinity categories should be homotopy equivalent. And that's strong enough to tell us how the Rij complexes change up to homotopy equivalents. And so let, to, to state that, that the solution of this wall crossing formula, let me um, remind you of what a cone in homological algebra is. So um, if F is a chain map, then the cone on F is the new chain complex where I take the sum of the vector spaces uh, with shifting the grading by one and use that chain map to put an off diagonal term in the different de definition of the differential. So here's the wall crossing, the basic Chikati Valpa wall crossing situation. So at a point in parameter space, so the, the screen here is a, say parameter space and there's a real co-dimension one wall where zij is parallel to zjk. So on the left of the wall, we have one kind of zeta instanton and we can use that to define a chain map from rik to rij tensor rjk. On the other side of the wall, there's another kind of instanton that defines a chain map going the other way. Okay, and so now we can solve the wall crossing form uh, constraint, at least for alpha is, ex um, is, ex is exact, by saying that the chain complex of type IK on the right is the cone given by this chain map on the left. And the, the situation, of course, is symmetric. The chain complex on the left is homotopically equivalent to the cone on the chain map on the right. And conversely, if the A infinity categories are homotopically equivalent up to homotopy, then the uh, left and right IK soliton chain complexes are related up to homotopy equivalents by these cone constructions. So here again is the solution of the wall crossing, the categorical wall crossing formula. Of course, if I take Euler characters, then I immediately get the old chikati vafa wall crossing formula rather trivially. So I like to call these Chikati-Vafa cones. And 
the goal of the paper in progress with Asan is to generalize this to the case with twisted masses. So now I see I'm out of time. So Jan, what would you like me to do? Uh, well, I interrupted you many times, so I think you can continue. Yeah. Just okay. Well, yeah. I might end up I, I I might end up just you know talking to you, but that's okay. Um, uh, I'm happy well, to do that. <laughs> we, we can vote. We can ask. Uh, um, uh, well, yeah. I I need. Uh, I'll I'll stop from time when I come to good stopping places. I'll stop. Uh, okay. I, I I did I did give practice the talk and it it seemed to be an hour to me, but obviously I've been going a little more slowly and um, just explaining things a little more slowly. That that's fine. Um, but you just let me know when I've gone too long. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so let me say just a few words about generalization to twisted masses. As I said, that's the work in progress with Asan. So we begin with a definition. We say that, remember, in the case of twisted masses, we had these relative homology classes, and we, uh, which I'm calling charges. And we say we have a cyclic fan of charges if we have a cyclically ordered set of charges such that the phases of the corresponding central charges are monotonically decreasing. That is, they're going around clockwise in the complex plane. And the main new ingredient here is that successive central charges can be parallel. In the previous case where there were no twisted masses, the central charges were strictly increasing or de strictly decreasing in phase. Now, if we have the case, if we have the situation where um, the successive vacua are all distinct, we'll call that an irreducible fan, uh, ir irreducible cyclic fan of charges. And then we have a picture like this, which is familiar from the GMW formalism. And uh, to this picture, we associate the cyclic product of these uh, MSW complexes. And then the web formalism gives us an L infinity algebra structure on the sum of all these uh, spaces. But now we can have um, a cyclic fan of charges that looks like this. So um, we can have a vacuum goes I0 to I1, and then several of the successive charges only take the vacuum I1 to I1. So we'll think of this as, as a single ray, but labeled by a whole sequence of n equals two central charges, all of which are parallel. So we could have a vector gamma I1, I1, and we could have it multiple times, and then we could have multiples of gamma I1, I1, multiple times, and so on. So that's the, that's the kind of um, uh, uh, cyclic fan of charges that we're going to have. Now, this has some new features. So now if we sum up the charges as we go around a vertex, it, uh, the sum might not be zero, so the sum of central charges might not be zero. And that violates the so-called no force condition, which uh, does violence to the uh, web formalism. So for example, if you have a, if you have a vertex like this where, where the forces don't balance and you try and do the Kantsevich, Kapranov, Soibelman type formalism, go to the polygons, well, the dual polygon doesn't close. The vertices of the polygon only close up to a deck transformation. And then another thing that can happen is even if the polygon does close, if I um, say for charge two gamma J, instead I have, imagine I have a sequence of charges, gamma J, gamma J, then what you have to do in this new formalism is you have to insert extra vertices along the edge of the polygon. So it's in a sense a degenerate polygon. It has, um, it has vertices where the angle is 180 degrees. So how should we represent these generalized webs? So in, in the old case, we just took products of the MSW soliton complexes as we go around the fan. Um, how, what do we do now? Well, what we do is for each um, charge associated with periodic solitons, we introduce a graded Fox space on the MSW complex. And so now if we have this situation where we have three distinct vacua, i, j, and k. Uh, to this line, we associate the product over all of these Fox spaces associated with all of the possible periodic solitons, such that z, gamma, j, j, or, 
uh, lies in, the, in this angular sector. So now we, to define the L infinity algebra, we, we sum over all the irreducible fans of uh, charges, and then, um, and then to an irreducible fan of charges, we insert the Fox spaces in between the angular sectors uh, separated by the Fox spaces. So here's a picture from Asan's thesis uh, illustrating the case of just three distinct vacua. So uh, without, without the periodic solitons, we would just have R gamma ij, R gamma jk, and R gamma jki. Uh, but with the periodic solitons, we put in these Fox spaces of periodic solitons in between. And the conjecture is that this has a natural L infinity structure associated with the generalized webs. And we do not have a proof of that conjecture, but we did check it in several uh, non-trivial special cases, including the CP1 model. Now you can also define the A infinity category of brains in a similar way. So the R hat IJ will be a sum over all the half plane fans with Fox spaces inserted when the vacuum doesn't change. And then the conjecture is that R hat and RC is again the structure of this what GMW called an LA infinity category, but I think more standard math terminology is open closed homotopy category. And it's nice to observe that you can recover RC by taking a kind of trace on this matrix of complexes R hat with times R hat opposite. That's the um, categorified monodromy. You take the trace of the category categorified monodromy and you get the closed space RC. So let me give you an example of this formalism in action. That's the CP1 model. So that's our peacock pattern. We have two vacua and a rank one deck group. Let's take H to be the upper half plane. So we have this kind of, of peacock pattern. And then R hat, well, uh, the R hat tends not to be a product of the categorified S factors. And then in the middle, we have these Fox spaces associated with all of the solitons of type II and JJ. And then again, we have the product of the elementary factors as we keep going clockwise to the other side. And so here's R hat, and the conjecture again is the matrix elements of R hat are morphism spaces in an A infinity category with multiplications deformed by an interior amplitude, uh, a Mori Cartan element on RC. So it's interesting to multiply out this infinite set of matrices and see what you get. And to do that, we introduce FII, which is the tensor product of all these Fox spaces and A sub gamma ij, which is the direct sum of these MSW complexes of, of, of charges I not equal to J and so on. And so you multiply out these matrices and you get expressions that look like this. So um, here's, here's again the II matrix element for this kind of two by two matrix of complexes. So what happens as we cross a wall, this new kind of wall we call a K wall, we, is that we write R hat prime in the reverse order. And so of course we have uh, primed complexes on the other side of the wall. And demanding homotopy equivalence of the A infinity categories leads to the homotopy equivalences of these chain complexes for the primed space uh, complexes in terms of the original ones. And this categorifies the general solution of the 2D 4D wall crossing formula I showed before. Now notice that there's an inverse in the relation of A prime to IJ to A, and that inverse categorically becomes the causal co-dual of these um, Fox space, oh well, of this R hat II. Um, and interestingly, causal duality has been, uh, in the last few years, has been playing an increasingly important role in various aspects of physical mathematics, although I don't know a direct relation of this uh, use of causal duality to the previous ones. All right, Jan, so that's um, the little I'm gonna say about the twisted masses, and now, again, I need some guidance. I could spend another 10 minutes about uh, to talk about the application to three-dimensional superconformal uh, super, super, super Not invariants will appear here, or there is a uh, Pardon? You may in in your title you have an application to not invariance. That that's that's this last section. Ah, okay. It takes yeah. about ten minutes. All right.
You're okay with that? Yeah, I, I am. Okay. Okay, then I'll talk about it. Right, let me minimize the gallery here. Okay, yeah. So, okay. So this is, as I mentioned before, um, an application of this formalism that's work in progress with Asan and Davide Gaiato and Feiyan. So the motivation for what we did is a recent striking conjecture by Garofalidis, Gu, and Mourinho in a paper called Peacock Patterns and Resurgence in Complex Chern Simons Theory. And what they did is they observed a remarkable and unexplained identity between some Q series or QX series. So on the one hand, it was the Witten index or the character valued Witten index of a certain three dimensional quantum field theory, supersymmetric quantum field theory. And the, the quantum field theory in question is a theory um, known as a class R theory associated with a hyperbolic knot complement, MK. So M sub K, K is a knot inside S3. M sub K is the knot complement. It's a hyperbolic three manifold. And to that, you can associate a certain three-dimensional quantum field theory I'll, I'll review in a moment. Anyway, three-dimensional quantum field theories with supersymmetry have Witten indices, character-valued Witten indices, and that gives us a QX series. On the other hand, they were sto studying Stokes matrices associated to the thimbles in complex churn simons theory on this three-manifold MK. And they computed the Stokes matrices, and again, because of the multi-valuedness of the chern simons form, it's a Q series, a QX series, actually. And, um, and they observed to their astonishment that these series are equal. Uh, so, for the gauge group SL2? Thank you for the uh, group SL2C. Mm -hmm. That's correct, that's right. Um, we, and so what we did is we give it a natural context and state a conjecture about certain partial differential equations known as the Kapustin-Witten equations, which came up first in the geometric Langlands uh, correspondence, uh, which implies the GGM conjecture. And after formulating our conjecture, we learned a little bit later that that conjecture, in fact, had been stated before uh, by Viktor Mikhailov uh, for very different reasons in a very, very beautiful paper by Viktor Mikhailov. Okay, so what is a T of M3? What do I mean by that? So very briefly, the physicists believe that there's this weird, wonderful, not very well understood, six-dimensional theory Uh, Greg, we lost uh, we, your voice. Uh, uh, something happened with maybe with microphone. Okay, say something. No. How about this? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, in this way, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what happened is my headset had its battery run out. But ah, just, okay. Okay. Instead of changing the battery, I'll use my uh, microphone. Okay. So this is again an application of square dancing to, to physics. Um, so yes, so what is T of M3? So very, very briefly, the physicists believe in a six-dimensional supersymmetric theory. If you compactify that six-dimensional supersymmetric theory with a suitable partial topological twist on a three-manifold, you get a three-dimensional quantum field theory called T of M3. So I'm using here the identity that three plus three equals six. So T of M3 is a three-dimensional quantum field theory, and we can consider that theory on the three-dimensional space-time, which is a cigar times time. And then if we take that three-dimensional theory, T of M3, and give it a further partial topological twist, known as a homolo holomorphic topological twist, we can identify this Witten index I sub t of q of x with the trace over the q cohomology of local operators at the tip of the cigar. But you see, you can take that cigar and it has a u1 isometry of rotation and you can reduce using that isometry. And what you get is you're going from the three-dimensional theory now to a one plus one-dimensional quantum field theory, which is the kind of thing we've been talking about, which turns out to be a Landau-Ginsberg theory because the isometry the U1 isometry is a fixed point at the tip of the cigar. That one plus one dimensional theory is 
only valued is valued on a half line. So there's a boundary condition, which for the moment are called B sig R. And the Q closed local operators in the three dimensional theory turn out to be the boundary operators for that brain B sig R. And so if you work this through, you find that the turn, the this character valued Witten index is nothing but the character of the HOM space of the B sig R to itself of corresponding operators. So J1 and J2 are some global symmetries of this theory with the cigar. And so we can think of this three-dimensional uh, character-valued Witten index as the character of the hum space of the cigar. Now, what is this landau ginsburg theory? Well, so hop is what? Home hop, opposite? Hop is, hop is, is hum in the opposite category. Yeah, okay. That's my, that's my, my, yes, you could have had to ask that before when I defined R hat, R hat as an A infinity category. I defined the hop spaces. Hop means hum in the opposite category. It's just that the, the compositions go the right way <laughs> for the figures. Um, uh, yeah, so what is this Landau Ginsburg model? It's our friend, the Chern Simons Landau Ginsburg model associated to the manifold M3. And now why is that? Well, as I just described it, um, you, the, you, you get the theory T of M3 by compactifying the six dimensional theory on M3. And then you get the landau ginsburg model by reducing using the uh, U1 isometry on the cigar down to R plus times IT. But you, you could do it in the other order and you can do it in the other order again because of all these topological twistings. So if you first reduce with the U1 isometry, you get five dimensional super Yang mills famously on M3 times the half line R plus times time. If you then reduce that on M3, then it's just an exercise in gauge theory to see that that is equivalent to the churn simons landau ginsburg model for M3, much like the super quantum mechanics on the mapping space before was the one plus one dimensional landau ginsburg model. So the landau ginsburg model, two dimensional landau ginsburg model with this infinite dimensional target space of connections on M3 is a five dimensional quantum field theory. Okay, so that identifies the landau ginsburg model. Now we had this uh, mysterious B cigar boundary condition. I claim it's something that should be called the NOM boundary condition and uh, the way that goes is if you do this U1 reduction of the six dimensional theory, then you're in the world of gauge theory. You have the five dimensional super Yang mills on this five manifold M3 with its Ramanian metric times R plus with just its Euclidean metric dy squared times R time. Now, Witten considered exactly this kind of thing and showed that the BPS equations of this 5D super Yang mills are just the Kapustin Witten equations from geometric Lingland's theory on M3 times R plus. With the important boundary condition that as Y goes to zero, the Higgs field of the Kapusen-Witten equation is, has a first order pull in Y with a residue, which is the dry bind, a frame for the, spin, for the Riemannian metric on M3. And the uh, gauge field of the Kapusen-Witten equation is just the spin connection, just becomes the spin connection on M3. And indeed, in these kapustin witten equations, you can choose a gauge where phi y and a y are zero, and then they become exactly the zeta soliton equations for this churn simons landau ginsburg model associated to M3. Now, rem remember that the vacua of the churn simons landau ginsburg model are the flat connections, sigma i, on M3. And so we have associated to vacua, we have left shed symbols. And so the B-NOM has an expansion in terms of multiples of these left shed symbols where the multiples, curly E, are called chan Payton spaces. They are themselves complexes. And what they are, are the MSW complexes for the Kapustin-Witten equations with NOM boundary conditions as Y goes to zero. And the um, complex connection goes to the flat connection sigma I for Y goes to infinity. So these E's are actually very, very concrete things. Now, going back to our character of the hum space for the cigar, we can, B cigar is, a, is or B num 
is a sum over these left shed symbols, so we can just expand that out. But what is the what is the character of the Hom space for thimbles? That is the Stokes matrix for Chern Simons Landau Ginsburg for, uh, for Chern Simons theory. So because you can express that in terms of intersection matrices of of left shed symbols for the Chern Simons functional. So um, so that's the kind of thing that GGM were relating their 3D index to. So in order to get this relation, we need the, uh, the traces on the chan Payton spaces to be rather trivial. So to get the GGM conjecture, we have to say that if M3 is a knot complement of a hyperbolic knot, then among the flat SL2C connections on MK, there's a distinguished one, so I'll call it sigma one, which corresponds to the complete hyperbolic metric. If I think of the SL2C connection as the spin connection plus I times the dry bind. And so the conjecture says that these Chan Payton spaces for these multiplying these different left shed symbols are all zero except for sigma I equals sigma one. So that's a very concrete conjecture on the um, Kapustin-Witten equations. And as I said before, exactly that conjecture had been made by Viktor Mikhailov for general uh, complete hyperbolic three manifolds M3. And he had, in his paper, presents a, 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 a number of pieces of evidence for that conjecture. It's relate, related to a volume conjecture of Jones polynomials. It also, as I just demonstrated, gives a natural explanation of the remarkable observation of Garofilidis, Gu, and Mourinho. And it extends a theorem, a uniqueness theorem, due to the Matteo and Witten, uh, where they stated it for Euclidean R3. So it's extending it from Euclidean R3 to hyperbolic three manifolds. If indeed the solution is unique, then we actually know the solution exactly. It's given by these formulas here. Now, there's an interesting generalization here where we imagine we have a colored link in M3. It's colored by representations of, let's say, SL2C. And Witten showed that you can modify these non-boundary conditions of five-dimensional super Yang mills by what physicists would say is inserting in a tuft line. So that defines a new brain in the chern simons landau gisberg model, B of L, which up to homotopy equivalence only depends on the isotopy class of L and M3. And so that leads to new, potentially new, not invariants. So we conjecture that the category, the A-infinity category of brains associated with the chern simons landau gisberg model on M3 is in fact a three manifold invariant. And um, we can we can we can restrict to the subcategory given by the brains B of L with L running over the isotopy classes of colored links. And we can consider the A infinity algebras, which are these hum spaces or hop spaces from B of L to itself. And so the idea is that uh, there's a new kind of not invariant uh, or link invariant, colored link invariant, where to a colored link, L, in a three manifold, we associate an A infinity algebra, which is this A infinity algebra. And so this is what we're uh, trying to understand. So to conclude, uh, sorry to be so late, to conclude, using the framework of GMW, we derived a categorified version of the chikati waffle wall crossing formula I indicated that the framework can be extended to the case with twisted masses. Uh, we, there are qualitatively new features in that case involving Fox spaces of periodic solitons and causal duality of complexes. And the circle of ideas when applied to chern simons landau ginsburg theory associated to a three-manifold gives a natural framework for interpreting a recent striking conjecture of GGM uh, and moreover suggests potentially new uh, colored link invariants. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So, uh, questions, please. So, actually, I, I have some rather comments uh, wow. because, uh, I mean, uh, I, I looked at the list of participants, it's my, my, almost exclusively mathematicians, so they did some maybe 
translation and it's okay. more difficult to uh, to translate from uh, i would say from physics to mathematics but maybe you disagree <laughs> maybe the other way around so what's going on uh, you have uh, say let's take keller manifold not necessarily compact you have a holomorphic one form with simple zeros for example a riemann surface compact Riemann surface and the holomorphic one form. It's a mathematically very good object in dynamical systems. Yeah. Moduli space of a billion differentials. Now, um, uh, you want to develop something which is similar to Landau-Ginsburg theory, but the point is that in Landau-Ginsburg, for example, for the potential with Morse critical points, a key role is played by symbols. Right. We generate the Foucault's ideal category. And right. here the behavior of symbols is very complicated. It can be chaotic. And this is exactly why people in dynamical systems study. So mathematically, this means that you have nicely defined uh, local picture, local cohomology, say generated by local symbols but you cannot extend them to an isomorphism between local and global. And uh, last week we had uh, a talk of Denis Aru who uh, showed a different example with more complicated Landau-Ginsburg potential where indeed this local to global isomorphism is difficult. So somehow it's hidden in Greg's uh, talk, but this local to global isomorphism is a key Key point. Uh, that's very interesting. Now, I, I heard Den Denis Aru. Uh, yeah, Denis, oh, uh, well, Denis Aru, no. He spoke about mirror symmetry and he considered uh, some particular uh, Landau Ginsburg potential, like in C cube, you take a potential which is product XYZ. So it has a quite complicated, relatively right, more complicated. Right, right. Uh, structure of critical right. uh, so, locus. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to understand something here. So, um, in fact, I heard him speak at, at String Math, and um, uh, I asked him if so. He's he's doing the case where there is a well-defined superpotential, right? Yep. Okay, so it's a little different, right, um, from having alpha with periods. Well, yeah, as for but, periods, so, we so just developed this. you could this explain more about what you mean by local to global. Local, um, we, we've just developed this theory with Maxim. We actually I spoke to him today on the piece of this paper. It's a part of a, a, a kind of a very big project, which we started years ago called holomorphic floor theory. Okay. And this is a, kind of an example of that story. So. Uh, suppose that you have um, a non-compact, even not necessarily Keller, uh, complex manifold with a holomorphic one form in any dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, now, and uh, um, like if this is an exact form, like differential of 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 a potential, yeah. Then you have this uh, twisted differential, uh, twisted uh, Durham complex, mm -hmm. which you and you have it also for one form as well. Now, if the form is exact, then you can uh, associate with the critical locus. It's not necessarily Morse uh, 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 critical points. It's quite general. You take just a neighborhood of your critical locus. And you can define uh, two types of cohomologies, uh, local DRAM working with a twisted DRAM complex, it's easy, and local Betty, which is more complicated. But nevertheless, now, this is something which sits near your critical locus or uh, the locus of zeros of your one form, if it's non-exact. Now, if you consider uh, globally the same story, you have to compactify your complex manifold first to take care about the behavior at infinity. Mm -hmm. And for one forms, it's a non-trivial theorem. And in fact, you can compactify, say, 
written by normal crossing divisors mm -hmm. in algebraic situation. And there are three types of divisors at infinity. One, when your uh, form kind of behave as dx divided by x in the power bigger than one, mm -hmm. non-logarithmic. Another one is logarithmic, so there will be a monodromy at infinity and you can have also something horizontal when your one form does not uh, have a monodromy around it just have nice limit so okay. and this is essential for defining global story for defining uh, global this compactification and yeah if you'd like for extension of alpha well you're not really extending to, alpha to, alpha to define the global analog of the symbol uh -huh. If your uh, the potential is multi-valued, if you have one form, so you you have to compactify carefully. But anyway, in the end, you have two uh, type of cohomology theories. One which sits near your critical locus or locus of zeros of your one form, but it doesn't matter because locally um, any, any 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 closed form is exact. So and there is also a global theory. When you consider this compactification of your space and you take care about global symbols, and it's quite complicated. And so then the question is whether your local story is isomorphic to the global oh. one. It's what the conventional Morse theory gives you. You work with a critical locus of a function, but you compute global homology or cohomology. I see. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now in uh, in holomorphic setting, you do not have Morse complex because generically differential is trivial, but you still have this question about local and global uh, cohomology, both Becky and Deram. Okay, this is first question which has to be answered, and it's non-trivial. In particular, in order to have this isomorphism, over the field of complex numbers say you have to take a bound exponential bound on the transversal sections of your symbols because they can sort of uh, you know like even on the surface they can um, make a spiral mm -hmm. and in higher dimensions if you take the transversal to this symbol uh, the volume can behave in unpredictable way. So in general, it's a conjecture that there is an exponential bound. So then there are some mathematical questions just to define what you are talking about. Uh, and probably in physics kind of you ignore uh, these uh, questions, but when it's done, then indeed you can ask about okay i'd like to see some pathological examples th things you would consider pathological it's very see what easy. goes they, wrong with the physics well i don't know but uh, maybe not pathological but rather uh, complicated examples take indeed an abelian differential on on, on a riemann surface oh actually we, uh, in my paper with Hassan, we do that we take an elliptic curve Ellip elliptic curve it's easy because yes, it's right. Calabi you, you 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 can choose one form without zeros no 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 well take no, take no, genus no. bigger than one say we genus take sorry a punctured elliptic curve i think yeah punctured elliptic no, no 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 it, it doesn't take something like the weierstrass uh function times d phi uh, yeah but uh, i suggest you to do an exercise which we did with maxim and it's quite interesting take a genus two curve okay so then uh, you know uh, uh, you have holomorphic uh, forms as many as <laughs> two <laughs> independent forms yeah. yeah and try to uh, to work out okay i mean you're allowing puncture we would i mean no no no, no. Example I just there, gave there are no whole... punctures punctures from my point of view it's the same as this compactifying divisors at infinity which are uh, which can be of three types either where uh, your form has a pole of order bigger than one okay or whether it's logarithmic oh. yeah where there is a monodromy 
or the third one on the surfaces, it doesn't, it's not interesting. All right. And so I, I'm considering instead of allowing the pole, as probably you did for the elliptic curve, I okay, consider yes. purely holomorphic uh, example, okay. but for D minus okay. two, sure. just zeros. It's already interesting. Yes, okay. Of course, the question about what we uh, uh, call this Maxim wall crossing structure, which implies these wall crossing formulas, which you mentioned. Uh, and indeed, we, we can define this wall crossing structure for uh, surfaces. We uh, worked out an example uh, of this, this square tiled surfaces of, 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 of genus uh, two. It's very interesting because it answers, uh, although implicitly the long standing question about the counting of saddle connections like what deep, connection? Deep, uh, saddle uh, saddle connection oh, connection. oh yeah, yeah. this right, your right. gradient yeah, yeah. Uh, gradient trajectory for this one form between two zeros yeah, yeah. and so the virtual number this bps number dt invariants and so uh, in order to compute them you can either kind of consider it as a enumerative problem and it's complicated that's what people in dynamical system did. Or you can use our formalism of wall crossing structure, but you have to construct it. And in order to construct it, you have to prove the isomorphism between local and global Baytic homology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's part of the story. Because this uh, automorphism, which you denoted K gamma, uh, they they are part of this wall crossing uh, structure story and indeed we did it but only uh, over non-archimedian field not over a uh, field of complex numbers but probably it's what, not what was the problem with complex numbers for surfaces probably no problem but for higher dimensions uh, yes, so not... you did it periodically for for uh... Right. Yeah, I mean, it's not really periodically, it's any non Archimedean field, but for example, periodic okay. will be okay. And it's very interesting why, but it's a separate story. But anyway, if you assume this isomorphism between local and global Baytic homology, like roughly speaking, that any local symbol defines you a global one. Okay. Uh, uh, then indeed uh, there are all crossing formulas and from then you can derive kind of from our general uh, story this is from 2008 you can derive uh, the number of saddle connections uh, uh, yeah so this is just for for human surfaces it's already interesting on higher dimensions we, that's what we discussed today it's <laughs> it's exponentially more difficult. Well, so you have to have an interesting uh, H one, right? It's not just a. It's not just the because point. I was, you know, my first thought would be, what? What about a K three surface? I mean, a, a, an abelian surface. I mean, the next thing, next thing to do is look at a surface. So, uh, any, anyway, I, I I can kind of give now with kind of with what we've done with Maxim, it can okay. be a lecture course on that, but not now because, you know, but I, I just wanted to make a comment that there are some interesting mathematical uh, questions related to the basic setup. Okay. Complex manifold, not necessarily compact with a holomorphic one form. And the assumption is that the set of zeros is a finite union of compact uh, sub varieties. Okay. Yeah, that's that's interesting because uh, from the physical point of view, that would mean it's it's not it's not a massive theory. There are massless modes, and that I think would um, make the physics story interesting, quite interesting actually. So the, uh, yeah. I, I assume that the um, the zeros are isolated and Morse. Uh, no, just finitely many components. I mean, they can be like what Denis called it last time, Morse bot. Like it's yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. They yeah, just but still, uh, the still from the physical point of view, that's actually uh, that's a non-trivial difference from what I assumed. 
No, but let me make one more comment and which connects it to uh, to the complex Chern Simons, which ah, you mentioned. Okay, good. Mm, and uh, the point so, is so Jan, um this the work you just described is that available i mean is there, there we, we or just or we, we just or... polishing it and You're as always it. with maxim you never know uh, when it will be ready uh, okay. for uh, are there are there lecture series or anything like that that uh, one uh, could learn I, I think uh, we both gave a couple of talks recently. Uh, Maxim gave, uh, um, I believe, like uh, three talks. Okay, that's and, the kind of thing I'm wondering about. Are yeah, those, and I I, 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 I I gave a couple of talks. Okay. So I, I, I can kind of find the video and send it to you. Yeah, send me the links, please. Yeah, all, all right. Now, as for Chern Simons, yes, again, yes. it's an example of a closed one form. This local Betty uh, cohomology, which depends on, on the neighborhood of your set of zeros of your one form, yeah. of critical locus, uh, there is an alternative description um, for that, which is not topological, but algebra geometric. You, you uh, choose uh, anti you, you find the potential around your uh, set of zeros of your one form, okay. find the function with a differential equal to your one form, it, and take the shift of when no, you wait, wait, that's I, local, that's a kind of local turn Simons. Function. Yeah, it's local, but it's interesting. But it's turn Simons essentially. Uh, yeah, it's turn Simons, but kind of. Yeah, it's Chern it Simons. Be relative yeah, in the case of relative Chern Simons, relative. No, no, no. It's Chern, it's Chern Simons. Yeah, but it, now it, the well, point. But it has. It's going to be well defined. So it's going to be relative Chern Simons relative to some connection. Yeah, okay. yeah. For example, yeah, you you fix some um, some connection a zero. Okay, and, okay yeah. there we go. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, but now you take the shift of vanishing cycles and take the cohomology with coefficients and the shift of vanishing cycles. Okay. So then you have a purely algebra geometric uh, uh, local story. And uh, we developed with Maxim, but uh, kind of maybe indeed 10 years ago, this cohomological whole algebra right. formalism. And in the last, section of that paper we asked um, exactly i mean first we formulated um, we, we proposed some invariant of um, of three or of compact three manifolds uh -huh. which is based exactly on the cohomology of um, this um, if you'd like critical locus so maybe you can take the space of all connections mm -hmm. with coefficients in this shift of vanishing cycles mm -hmm. so basically and we ask a question uh, uh, how to categorify this cohomological whole algebra and automatically this invariant mm -hmm. which i believe is not very far from uh, what your yeah well i was actually way. wondering if I mean, I was just thinking, oh, well, we have all these algebraic structures with Fox spaces. Is that related to your cohomological whole algebra? I was wondering about that, actually. No, no, no. But basically, your whole crossing structure before categorifications, it's like um, a, a direct sum over all connected components, in your case, or critical points or zeros of your one form okay. of some cohomology groups. Okay. Uh, now, uh, for uh, any uh, element of the relative uh, one, uh, uh, relative homology group of the first relative homology group of the path gamma i j, yeah, you define some operator between these vector spaces, mm -hmm. and uh, so then you can formulate the usual non-categorified wall crossing formulas, wall crossing structure just in this way. All right. It's not 2D, 4D. It's just sort of a, it's a version of Chikoti Lav. All right. So now you categorify. So you want to replace this cohomology by an appropriate categories. 
such that a infinity categories, such that periodic uh, a homology of these categories, periodic cyclic homology are these hom homologies. So actually, I think we did something like that with Kapranov and Lev Sukhanov in this big paper mm -hmm. uh, in the archive. Uh, That's uh, the recent where, one from last fall, I guess? Uh, yeah, probably, yes, yes. Where we constructed uh, Schober uh, mm -hmm. um, categorifying this, our paper with Maxim, which you mentioned, yeah? So then we define some perverse Schober on, on C. So now local stories, if you'd like, are um, local Fukaya Zeidel categories, in case if your potential has only more critical points. And for every pair of critical points, you have a certain functor between these two categories and uh, these functors they satisfy some nice properties which are categorified picard lefschetz identities which mm -hmm. at the level of cycles it's okay. picard lefschetz mm -hmm. yeah but uh, then yeah, we... yeah 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 I th I th if i understand you correctly those are like the um categorified s wall crossing formulas uh and Mm. I, I think we call them S wall interfaces. And so there is a kind of braid relation, categorified braid relation, um, something like sigma ij, sigma ik, sigma jk is. No, no, no. But the point is that if you do it for any pairs, uh, yeah. for all possible triangles, yeah. so it's kind of an old idea that instead of looking of the. Mm, Maurer Cartan element. Actually, yeah. we use that idea. You start with something undeformed with this very simple basic Wait, uh, perverse job. You're deforming it with Maurer Cartan or something? Yeah, like and that. then we deform with Maurer Cartan. So basically, you are uh, mm, sort of a categorified uh, this uh, solutions to zeta instanton equations. It's, yes. it's uh, this. Mm, Maurer Cartan element for, yes, the, yes. You know, for, for, for the deformation of this perverse Schober. Yeah. Mm, so then mm, I think that kind of there is some gap between languages. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I haven't really studied the, 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 your paper from last fall that much. So I should, uh, on perverse Schober. It's, like... pretty, it's pretty abstract. We use some. Okay language of I think, I, infinity my, my vague understanding is that a, a Schober is like this categorified um, parallel transport that we associated with interfaces associated with has but that's a very vague understanding uh, yeah it's a sort of like uh, if you have a differential equation with let's say Fuchs equation with poles of order one, you look for shift of solutions. So you have local monodromies and you can transport between. So now it's a upgrade okay. all the yeah. way to categories. So, yeah. uh, and also, yeah, there are some other ideas how to include poles of order bigger than one then it's ah. something new, like irregular right, thing. Right. Yeah, but uh, what, what I mean that probably kind of part of what you, you have said can be spelled out um, uh, mathematically. That, that would, I, I don't know how to do that. I would be interested to see how that Especially works. for this one forms, it's very funny because we just discussed with Maxim, with Maxim. <laughs> with okay. to, today and it's part of kind of approved that paper okay and so then i see well, i'll look forward to uh anyway if you send me some links of talks though that would be actually yeah. pretty useful okay so uh more questions uh all right so Probably okay. maybe people are tired. It's almost two hours. It's two hours, yes. Yeah. All right. Greg, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And uh, thank you for the very, very interesting comments.